Uh, before we get started, I wanted to uh, make a quick introduction to our speaker, if that's okay for everyone. Uh, so today we're really, I'm really excited to have Dr. Obimbo Moses. Uh, he's an associate professor and is a clinical scientist and he's really enthusiastic and he has a passion for promotion of learning, research and teaching and clinical practice. Uh, he, he holds a postdoctoral, postdoctoral degree and a PhD in reproductive sciences. And he's a practicing obst obst obstetrician and gynecologist. And uh, he has extensively studied and mentored students on placenta microenvironment, HIV and structural biology. Um, and he's also applying novel molecular techniques such as laser capture, microdissection, RNA sequencing, uh, pro proteomics, um, metabolomics, and advanced bioinformatics in aspects of science and obstetrics and gynecology. So his expertise is ideal in building capacity at the University of Nairobi and other institutions in the region. Uh, he is currently supervising over 15 masters and seven PhD students who have shown attentiveness in working with them in areas of interest. So these students are at very different stages of growth in different institutions. So I think this is a really great opportunity for us to learn from Moses. And, um, and as I indicated before, he will be presenting his work, but um, throughout his talk, I would encourage everyone to ask him questions and have this as an informal informal session. So Moses, it's a pleasure and I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate your introduction, Lee. Uh, and thanks fellows for making time to come listen to me. Uh, my name's uh, Moses, as you've heard. And uh, I think I'm allowed, Richard, am I allowed to share my screen? I think I can share my screen. Let's see. Yeah, I think I am allowed to share my screen. So I have it here. Yeah. So I, I hope you can all see uh, my screen. I put it on a full mode. And so as Lee has indicated that uh, this is more or less, uh, I want to make it as much as an informal session as possible. So that's just not me going through a, a wall a series of the slides I've, I've, I have here but uh, feel free to interrupt anytime, ask questions, let me know what you think. And hopefully in the next 45 minutes or so, uh, we should be done uh, with the session and hopefully it will be very useful to you. Uh, so I titled my presentation as part two translation science to maybe just give uh, some form of figure to where can one begin and if you have potential for growth, which I think I still do, and all of you do, where, where can you head? Uh, so currently, as uh, indicated, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Human Anatomy and Obstetric Gynecology at the University of Nairobi, but I'm also the current uh, chairman of the Department of Human Anatomy, uh, uh, leading over 1,000 students and over uh, 30 staff members in the department. So I'll give you a bit of my brief background. Uh, I completed my medical degree uh, in 2006 at the University of Nairobi. Uh, but before this, I had been very fascinated with how science works. So growing up in my village, uh, I used to see, you know, people dying. And uh, just for the for information, I really used to fear dead bodies a lot. So anytime I had that a neighbor or someone in the village has died, I'd really be mortified, but still ask myself questions. What happened? How did they die? Then there came this uh, problem that I, I became aware of, HIV AIDS, that was really killing people. And a few people in my village started dying of that disease. And uh, I kept on asking myself, uh, can the cure of this uh, disease be found so that people do not die so much in my village? So I developed interest in, medi in medicine from an early age when I was still in the primary school. So when I went to high school, I continued with that aspiration. Uh, I studied uh, biological sciences, physics, which I did very well. And at the end of that, I was able to write uh, like two textbooks in biology and another one in physics to just show interest in the area of sciences and innovation. So when I came to medical school, this was really a culmination of my dream. 
and I vote to really study uh, medicine, but at the same time to try as much as possible uh, to understand how science works and how science exists in medicine. After having done medical school, I went out for internship and then became a medical officer. And then I was given a, a, a scholarship, having been a top student in the human anatomy to study uh, human anatomy at a master's degree level, uh, which I did. And uh, I also was given a job as a tutorial fellow at that particular time. So I joined the department as a tutorial fellow in the year 2007. And uh, while I did, I studied human anatomy, I completed a degree, uh, then went ahead to study my PhD uh, in human anatomy at that particular time. My research then, both at the MSc level and the PhD level, focused on the uterine vascular biology. And here, I basically wanted to understand the adaptation of the uterine vascular system uh, when it came to the blood supply of the uterus and how it adopts at different physiological states. Because you have this very young uh, girl, then she grows into puberty, then uh, reproductive age and she gets pregnant, then after that she becomes old. So all these times, how does the uterine artery uh, adapt itself towards uh, ensuring that there is good reproductive performance? Uh, by that time, I still had interest in pursuing my clinical uh, degree. So I, I, I applied and joined to uh, residency in obstetric gynecology. So as I studied obstetric gynecology, what kept on hitting my head is how do I combine the hardcore science that I've now learned the various techniques in science with the clinical practice. So it was by chance then that I met uh, one of my mentors from the US, uh, Dr. Craig Cohen. Uh, and every year I'd made it a point to be attending the University of Nairobi and Manitoba collaborative research group. So I, I, one of my friends who had done uh, epidemiology at master's level at UDA introduced me to uh, Dr. Craig. And I was able to talk to him and ask him uh, you know, how do I get to combine my clinical, you know, skills and uh, my budding interest as a scientist. So we had a very long talk. And uh, from then, uh, I had very good ideas on how to be able to combine now my science and uh, my clinical practice. So then uh, I went ahead, sorry, uh, the following year under his mentorship, he introduced me to my other mentor in the US, uh, Professor Susan Fisher. And uh, by then uh, I wrote a proposal and they helped me apply for the International Mental Scientist Award program in HIV AIDS in 2015, which allowed me to do some work on the placenta and spend some time at Fisher's lab, learning advanced uh, biological techniques, the ones that I've not learned at the PhD level and at the master's level. By the same time, it enabled me to see and meet a few people who are doing both clinical practice, but at the same time able to have a very good conversation when it came to science. So this was a very inspirational moment for me, uh, being able to bridge the gap between research and clinical practice. So by then, I went ahead, completed my residence in obstetric gynecology, also having spent some time in the US in the lab and I was really now inspired. My career was going to grow and uh, I was very, uh, very sure that I'd be able to combine now science and uh, the clinical practice, though the threads weren't fully fixed yet. So I was lucky again under the mentorship of the two and plus my local mentors here. So Gengo and Professor Elizabeth Bukusi Professor Anzala, they helped me uh, write a proposal, which then I got to uh, do local fellowship. And one of the very inspiring moments was when we went for an orientation program at uh, Bethesda. At that particular point, I was able to meet, uh, you know, various scientists uh, who work at NIH. And one thing that they kept on talking about is that they used to hang stethoscope over their necks during the day and in the evening. So early mornings, they'll be spending some time trying to understand the nature of the diseases in the lab. Uh, I think we had talks from uh, very eminent personalities like Dr. Diana Bianchi, uh, Dr. Franz Collins, uh, Dr. Anthony Faushi, my mentor, Dr. Craig, Dr. Elizabeth Bukusi, who gave us very inspirational talks, including how to be able to pose for a, photograph, a good photograph 
as a scientist. So, you know, I remember all those talks and the learning points that we had at that particular time. So the concepts that we, we learned at that particular time really helped us clarify the very important areas and how we'd be able to get ourselves moving into, into research. So I've, I've just quoted the Glocal Mantra, Glocal uh, Health Fellowship Mantra provided at the UC site that their aim is to be able to train uh, researchers with outstanding interdisciplinary education and training in innovative research designs so that health of the population can be improved around the world. And I think uh, for me, the, that drive was to be able to mix those two aspects, science in production within the clinical practice and translate the knowledge learned at the, at the bench to bedside and actually get some information, some gaps from the bedside and bring them up to the, up, up to the bench. So uh, then uh, we did some work in, in that area and I'll, I'll just give a brief of what kind of work we did. Uh, then uh, the following year, I was able to apply for the preterm birth initiative fellowship, which I was also lucky to, to get. And this allowed me to spend about two years in uh, San Francisco back and forth. Uh, while in this fellowship, I was able to strengthen and add skills in various scientific techniques. And so I was able to learn about uh, uh, confocal microscopy, fluorescence, stem cell biology, uh, so many techniques that ordinarily I'd not have been able to learn them while, while this part of the world. I also improved my skills towards uh, uh, writing and developing manuscripts and being able to publish these particular manuscripts. Uh, while at it also, we, have, we were involved in presentation and I was involved in presentation both at the lab, Fisher's lab at Parnassus, where uh, at least every month you'll be expected to give a presentation on your progress of your work and what you're working on, what you're seeing. And so this was a, a very challenging time because sometimes when you're in this part of the world, you stay like three, four months without making any presentation. But uh, on the other side, every month or so, you'll be able to present something uh, this was the same at our collaboratory meetings at uh, Preterm Birth Initiative uh, at Bay, in the Bay, where every week we at least would have something to, to speak about. And uh, at least every quarter, then you have these very special collaboratory meetings that you invite guests from around the world and you'd be leading that talk. So it, it was quite a learning moment for me that uh, was filled with a lot of reflections and uh, how best to apply my, my skills to these particular settings. So uh, I, this is just a background. So if I give you a little bit of a background of the work that uh, I was focusing on and I still focus on uh, to today, uh, just having expanded the scope a little bit, the background here is uh, about 40 million people around the world live with HIV AIDS in Kenya. We have about 1.6 people who are affected. And uh, half of that, over half of that are actually women are affected by HIV. So these women, uh, about 76% of them are on treatment with antiretrovirals. And so my question here was, uh, uh, and based on the previous research done in Botswana, in Rwanda, and uh, some papers around the world, that had been association that HIV and antiretroviral therapy independently are risk factors for causing preterm birth. So I just wanted to try see uh, in the causation of the mechanistic part of preterm birth, is it at the placental unit, is it at the fetal unit, or how does this actually lead to the preterm birth? So mine was then look at the, uh, for women with HIV and uh, on antivirals uh, versus those who have normal term delivery, if there was any difference in terms of placental morphology. Uh, and I studied this uh, using uh, various techniques. This is uh, just a picture to show uh, the fetal placental unit, and this is the placenta, and this is a uh, maternal side, this is a blood vessel from the mother. And so uh, mine was to understand at this particular level what changes take place uh, so that you have impaired or an adverse uh, pregnancy outcome such as uh, preterm birth in this particular uh, group of population. So the questions here were, does HIV with uh, antiretrovirals cause placental damage? And uh, if they do so, 
what are the changes, and do these changes increase the risk of these women having preterm, uh, preterm or premature, premature birth? So uh, he applied various methods, just cross anatomical observations, uh, light microscopy, uh, stereology, morphometry, immunochemistry. So all these techniques I learned during my fellowship, like uh, during the Glockal Fellowship, I learned how to apply uh, uh, stereology, morphometry, uh, then uh, scanning electron microscopy. Then at the uh, preterm birth fellowship, I learned about electron micro transmission electron microscopy, immunofluorescence, and multiple cytokine analysis. And so these are now techniques that are very important trying to assay and look at the features of the placenta in this uh, women. And the, the funding allowed me to spend some time in, in South Africa because we did not have this uh, microscope in Kenya. So I had to spend some time in Cape Town to uh, doing electron microscopy work at the image here. And then of course I spent some time at UCSF at Fisher's lab. And some time I also spent at the Kenya AIDS vaccine initiative in labs just trying to explore uh, what placental uh, tissue and changes that were there. We've been able to publish some of this work and some others are still in preparation uh, uh, going forward. So uh, at this first part of this talk is that uh, uh, having done medical degree and residency in obstetric gynecology, uh, I had this urge of uh, practicing medicine as a doctor and patient care, uh, which still stands true up to today. And I spent about 40% of my time uh, doing patient care service and then doing a master of science and PhD in anatomy and then uh, local fellowship and preterm birth initiative uh, having ingrained quite a, a lot of scientific techniques, I'm able to operate in the lab and work with cells, work with placenta, work with endometrium as a, a scientist. And I spend about 60% of my time teaching, supervising, and doing research uh, in this particular area. And this has only been possible uh, through uh, mentorship, uh, uh, who are very helpful mentors, who are able to lead you and direct you uh, in new directions that can help you focus better and be more productive when it comes to these particular areas. So up to that point, I, I want to know if there are any questions or any reflections or any additions that anyone want to ask, then I, I'll go to the second part to, to just uh, continue talking a little bit about now general things for yeah. understanding my current work. Well, thank you, Moses, for providing the, the background and history of, of your career development. I think this is really helpful for the fellow. So, so as Moses indicated, if you have any questions for Moses at this point, please feel free to uh, share and um, ask some questions. Um, thank you for the interesting uh, presentation, Moses, um, thus far. Um, in your last slide, you actually answered one of the questions that I had after I had read your profile on um, your balance between your clinical work as an obstetrician gynecologist and um, as a researcher, and you said it's 40% to uh, 60%. I, I think that that was my my area as well. I recently quali qualified obstetrician gynecologist and your concerns are, okay, so do I set up my practice? If I set up my practice, how will it impact on my research? I mean, research is quite involving and I'm noticing that now that I started my data collection. So yeah, that that's, that, that's my question, that balance between your clinical work and um, research. Yes, thanks. Thanks so much, Ipo. I, I, I think the, that's, that's really a challenge. I talk to many people here in this country, in Kenya and in the, in the US, I'm spending some time in San Francisco. Many people say that you have to choose one path, either clinical service path or research path, but it's also, uh, you know, obvious that there are people who are able to do both. They're able to do patient care and they're able to actually work in the lab and, uh, and be able to work with cells and get some results out. So I, I don't think it's really impossible, but what just means it needs a lot of uh, effort and uh, dedication. One thing I've learned is having very disciplined time management, uh, say, uh, you know, that my clinic care services are on Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday morning and Saturday morning, and that's it. 
So in between, you don't want to do anything else so that you can focus on these other aspects of uh, what you're doing research. Uh, if you mix it up, then I think both sides, you might not be able to produce any results. And I think that's why it's a challenge. And more so for some of us who are venturing in new areas of uh, translation science, where you want to see whatever you are trying to innovate in the lab can actually work and provide value at the patient bedside. So it's, it's still quite an emerging area with not so much of funding, but uh, it, it means you really have to dedicate time to, to do that kind of work. Thank you, Chipo. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's great, Moses. And if I, if I want, if I, yeah, if I may uh, add a little bit, I think it's really important, um, you know, to the, the content that you shared so far, you know, in terms of the value of the GLOCAL Fellowship and how, how the training translates to the local community. And I think I would encourage every one of you to consider yourself as an expert in the area uh, where you are gonna be practicing. And I think it's an opportunity for you to translate the skills and you know, research methods that you learn through the fellowship but it is up to you to figure out how to make meaningful contribution to the community. So, you know, mentors from the US, they're not going to be the ones that will know the cultural aspects as well as, um, you know, meaningfully implementing the, the techniques that you learn. Uh, it is up to you. So I would, I would encourage all of you to trust yourself to, you know, think of you as an expert and the GLOCAL Fellowship is just a tool for you to enhance, you know, how you can make meaningful contribution in terms of translating what you learn as well as meaningful community engagement. So, and I, and I think, you know, fellows from the US can also learn bi-directionally uh, in terms of doing work in, you know, global settings. So um, I can't stress enough how important and, op, you know, um, a great opportunity this is uh, for the GLOCAL Fellows. That's true. Okay. Yeah. All right. Florella that was a had question. a question. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, it's very interesting uh, what you were presenting, and especially the. I, I wanted to ask you the challenges of um, developing translational research in a low and middle income country, um, where maybe the even the idea of having trainees in translational research is, is not there. And how did you get to work with mentees when you were already um, getting your grants and starting to have mentees? Uh, were they in the medicine um, from the medical school or were you having to work with uh, students from other schools, uh, which is something that maybe happens here. I am doing a little bit of um, bacterial genomics and there is a lot of work done with biology, but not with medicine. And the, this, this kind of um, thinking of bridging medicine with basic science is still very, very Mm, unusual here in Peru. Mm. So I, I wanted to hear what was your experience in that sense. Thank you very much, Lopez. I, I think some of the questions, I'll cover them in the second part of this uh, 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 lecture in the next few minutes. Uh, but yes, you're right that uh, uh, first of all, the uh, being able to develop a unit to carry out research and translation is, is, is not easy, uh, although we can bootstrap on the existing facilities that we have that mainly focus maybe on either pure clinical research or uh, basic science. So being in a position where I understand a little bit of biological sciences very well, I'm also able to understand uh, clinical science. So I can easily be able to look at uh, the aspects of this basic science that can actually have uh, very immediate or direct uh, effect on patient care. Uh, but having said that, I, I, as, you, as you know, that many medical people 
when they finished their school, they most of them go to clinic for practice because then it, they find it easy to get their money and so forth. And they don't want to have issues of writing grants, which they consider to be a little bit difficult. Uh, but then, so you need to get students at an early stage. Uh, and in our unit here, for example, we mentor students at a BSc level. So they, do, they start doing medicine, then they take a year off or two to do Bachelor of Science, then they continue with medicine. And then at that particular time, the, the idea mm. and the love for science has already been instigated in them. So once they're done with their school, then they want to pursue a bit of science and then they can still pursue a little bit of clinical work. So that makes it easy uh, to work with them. But then I've not stopped at that. I also look for some people from the Department of Biochemistry and those who've done biological sciences to work with them. So when you're working as a team, then it's easy to develop this. I haven't yet reached the place that I really want to go to, but I know that's the direction I'm heading towards, yes. So we should be able to get that moving. Thanks, Lopez, for your question. So yes, so I'll go on. That's OK. Uh, so what's the, the role of the mentors in, uh, in my career development? So I'll, I'll start, like, you know, when I was an undergraduate, first, being a first year student, I met my first mentor. Uh, here, Professor Ogengo, who was who used to really spend a lot of time teaching us human anatomy. And his was very practical that uh, he's teaching human anatomy that will help us treat patients. And uh, yeah, so I, I used to have, you know, talks with him. And up to today, it's about 21 years later, he's still my mentor he's, he's, he's at, the, at the university. And so, you know, he would tell us this, what you need to do, this, what you, you know, uh, how you need to read, how to be able to apply this science in your practice and, and so forth. Then uh, later, of course, I had other mentors at the medical school, but then later I also met Dr. Craig, who we had very extensive talk and we, we, we had an exchange of talk. The fortunate bit about me meeting him is that uh, Dr. Craig has spent so much time in Kenya and uh, he knows exactly what happens around. He knows our cultures and he knows our things. So it was very easy to you know, uh, interact and get ideas found on him. And so he really helped me see new perspectives on how I can be able to marry my OBGYN background with my science background and, and, and get to the, to, to the level that I really wanted to get. Then of course, when I went to Susan Fisher lab, at Panassas, uh, it's a very advanced lab. This was my first time to be exposed to such kind of a lab uh, where I, I learned new skills, working uh, with a placental explants, uh, you know, doing a uh, confocal microscopy, uh, stem cell biology work, how people present. So mentors can really help you learn these new skills if you are open uh, to learning from them. Uh, of course, uh, they have been very helpful in helping me meet uh, and build new networks. And so like uh, Dr. Craig, every time he sees someone who work, who's working in my area and might be of interest, he always does an email introduction for me. And uh, I find this very useful because then I don't have sometimes to do it myself when he's already done it for me. And then so I, from there, I follow it up and uh, I'm able to develop new networks that are very productive in my, in my career development. And uh, sometimes, you know, as usual, I, I know it happens to most of us, not all of us, that, uh, you know, you just want to feel relaxed and chill out. You don't want to have, you know, to write a paper. You don't want to submit a paper. You just want to relax. So your mentors will keep in check. They'll ask you, how far has that paper gone? What have you done? Is there something that's coming up, you know? So you, you somehow get to back to the road and to, to, to doing something. So I, I really I value my mentors for, for having made sure that at least there's some grant I'm writing, there's a paper I'm writing, there's a, there's a manuscript I'm submitting and things like that, which, which is really nice. Uh, so just providing that overall look to what, what you're doing. And with that, it has really helped me maintain focus and really grow. So I know there are many other roles that you read in career growth or what mentors will do. Uh, I can't list all of them, but I found this to be extremely important and useful to me as a person. When uh, it comes to uh, my career uh, post-fellowship, 
uh, and this I must mention first is that, uh, uh, so I initially when I came in, I, when I came back from the US was to come back to teach and do my clinical practice and then focus on my areas of research. And as I will demonstrate the next few slides that uh, I developed, I, I got a lab that uh, I started initiating this lab and have students in it to work on placental and other areas of productive system. Uh, but then while doing this work, I also got an administrative post, which was a new addition to me, quite unexpected because then I had a plan for it. But yes, they said, you know, in your leadership, you're still young and you'll inspire many young people to work hard and you're doing very well. So make a change and take it positively. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I became the chair and, uh, of the department, uh, managing many people, including some of my seniors. And uh, yeah, it's provided me with very good learning opportunities. It hasn't been an, a completely different paradigm, but I'm taking it because I spoke to my mentors as well. They encouraged me, they let me know what how best I can use the position and how to develop a focus for it. So it, I'm spending a bit of my time actually managing the, the, the administrative component, but it's been very good because I'm actually learning a lot in the process of doing this. Now, uh, besides the administrative work that I'm doing, um, also been able to expand on my work beyond the placenta. And so uh, I have like seven students working on different aspects of placenta from placental malaria, placenta malnutrition, placenta and uh, what you call uh, chorioamnionitis, where you have preterm premature rupture of membranes. Uh, so there are people working on placenta with me as my mentees, but I'm also expanded a bit of my work to include uh, vaginal microbiome. There's some work we did on vaginal microbiome and preterm birth, uh, and learning new techniques like generation sequencing and the bioinformatics pipeline and applying them as well. A new level of uh, metabolomics, which I'm applying for both the vaginal microbiome and uh, screening of uh, stillbirth, uh, and still related to reproductive health using science techniques, but these are potentially going to be able to form uh, or be a basis for, 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 for helping develop uh, screening tools or diagnostic tools. Uh, also doing endometrial biology in the current pregnancy loss. So uh, we, we are doing this with uh, one of my colleagues uh, where we are working to understand the role of natural killer cells in the women who have recurrent pregnancy losses in Kenya. So uh, the work that we started on placenta has really enabled me and the techniques learned there have enabled me to be able to expand the scope of the work that I'm doing in other areas of, uh, of the reproductive system, but all geared towards uh, enhancing uh, reproductive performance. Uh, so a few, uh, these are a few of my students that um, I'm, I'm mentoring. I'm trying to build capacity in this uh, translational capacity within the University of uh, Nairobi. Uh, some of them have gone through school. Some of them have uh, uh, just published, they have sent out manuscript for publication. Uh, there are eight more students working on the placenta and others working on the microbiome and so forth. And then, uh, so they, they work with various aspects that uh, would be of interest to, to us. And why, what I found to be very useful is that when you having a team that you mentor, it means a lot of work initially, but eventually what happens is that you have a big team and your productivity actually goes higher because then you don't have to do everything once you've trained them to do something. So this has been a very useful uh, addition to what you've been doing. Uh, if you go on, now this, the lab that we call the Basic Clinical and Translational Laboratory at the Department of Human Anatomy that we started, whose aim is to basically develop a basic and translational research and foundation laboratory or hub. And uh, our mission is to be able to work, as I've mentioned, on the placenta, uh, on the uterus, on the vagina, and the, on the cervix. Uh, within this particular unit, I'm still at the so-called baby steps towards getting this unit operational. And uh, of course, trying to also get funding for the unit to develop more, but funding can only come when we have a lot of productivity. And there's uh, there quite a number of papers that come and impact coming from our, our lab. And the focus 
generally is to help uh, mitigate uh, the adverse pregnancy outcomes in this part of the world, as uh, Lee has just mentioned, that you want to be contextualized. We want to make sure that the research that we do has a bearing on the improving health in our local setting, because we just don't want to do research because we have to do it. We want to do research that can be able to solve some of the problems that we actually experience in this part of the world, and including uh, the neglected uh, tropical diseases that not many people elsewhere do, uh, like leishmaniasis uh, in pregnancy and so forth, the infectious diseases that are quite common in this part of the world. And eventually, hopefully, when we develop the lab, we should be able to encourage uh, knowledge exchange between the East, the West, and the, the, the African part of the world. So here, we also want to really enhance collaborations. So uh, within this particular time, I've also been able to uh, increase my network beyond my traditional uh, network in San Francisco. Uh, I've been able to directly meet some collaborators in conferences, so meet them, they work in the area of what you're interested in. I'm able to talk to them, then uh, forge new collaborations with them. Locally, I work with groups like Kenya Medical uh, Research Institute and uh, Mount Kenya University. We've been able to write common proposals, though we don't win all of them, but at least it gives us a chance to, to, to network and see what new areas we can be able to work on locally. Uh, and through this particular team, we've also been able to involve other collaborators from uh, outside, like the Oxford, Oxford uh, University, the Uppsala University, uh, and other places. And, you know, we're working with them on different aspects of our pregnancy outcomes. And, and this has also proved to be very useful. Uh, it's always important that we maintain our old connections, our, uh, being productive, uh, you know, keeping in touch with your mentors, uh, getting to know what else you can do and what direction they can point you towards, getting a new facilitation. And then, of course, uh, industry, when they see you're a bit productive, they might be interested in your work. So recently, we are also trying to get in talk with some of the industry players to see how we can engage with them in some of the work. Because what we notice that most of the medicines we use around have been tested all over you know, the other parts of the world in the West, clinical trials, and so forth. But they have never been tested, though we use and consume these medicines, yet we know that the epigenetics and genetics matter and that you know the context also matters so there could only be difference between our ways of metabolizing some of these drugs and so forth so these are some of the talks now we are having with the industry players to see how best to involve them uh, in our in our research work so that can potentially also be very useful so uh, finally also so that something that's very important is writing as a team uh, that is something that I'm also learning, that you don't want to be the sole author writing a paper from the start to the end. You increase your productivity by doing the collaborative uh, writing. And here, basically, you like the mentees that we have, teach them how to write a draft, uh, they write different sections, uh, then you can have a meeting, you review and you rewrite and, and so forth. So if you are a team of six, seven people, then uh, each of you is attacking a part. You take a shorter time completing a draft than working as a single individual. And if you have three papers being worked on at the same time, of course, the chance of completing these manuscripts are higher. So uh, that's, that's an important aspect that one has to remember when you want to really publish, that don't always say you want to publish as a single person, you want to publish as a team so that you're able to move uh, this work forward. So, uh, this has been a bit of a challenge, but I've been able to get a few grants to continue a bit of my work. I continuously apply for many others. I applied for uh, development grants, career, develop career development grants, uh, fellowship grants, and uh, just grants to do the work. Uh, I've had a few successes, uh, and I think I'm still on the learning trail. I, I, I know I've also had quite a, a big chunk of uh, not successful applications. But then the, 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 the principle here is don't give up, keep on uh, applying. And uh, one thing I've discovered is be, being able to keep 
a calendar in your in your check so that you don't want to do the last minute rush you want to spend the last two weeks maybe just reviewing and, and getting a thing uh, submitted so uh, securing new grants is an ongoing process so don't be discouraged when you lose the first application or the second or the third you might lose up to the 10th but then keep on going after all you already applied for the local fellowship and you are admitted so it means there's a lot of potential for you to get another grant so don't give up and leave the research world alone i think it's important to continue doing uh, this work so yes so those were uh, people of course without my family support and the friends and the colleagues here it would not have been really possible and uh, remember one of the things that we have to learn for those of you who have families you have to be able to balance between your family and your uh, your work so I've been able to raise uh, three children, uh, uh, you know, when, when, while doing all this, and I still have time with them. I still, uh, you know, spend significant time with them on the US, they will be with me for some time. So I, I, I think this is very important uh, and their support is crucial to having you succeed. Of course, without our patients, we have to get material from and research assistance and work will not be able to be done. And the laboratories and the mentors that we have uh, are very important in making sure that our, our, our work is successful. So I'd want to then spend a few minutes uh, now, I think that marks the end of my presentation, uh, to just uh, mop up if there are any questions or any concerns, something that you touch you want to learn from me, I'm very happy to, to answer your question for, for the next few minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Moses. This was really great. And, um, you know, thanks for sharing um, your wisdom and knowledge. And uh, I think it's great that we have time for questions. And um, I want to emphasize again what Moses said, I think in terms of, you know, proposal development, as well as manuscripts, you know, I think, I think it's important to trust yourself and it is okay for, and it's, it's customary, even for manuscripts, you need to be able to accept that you know, it may not be published or accepted the first time you submit a submit a uh, paper, but it's a it's a learning uh, process. And I also want to highlight uh, what Moses said in terms of um, making a team team science approach, whether it's for a proposal or whether it's for manuscript writing, or even like you know before proposal designing a study and trying to figure out how how your study will have meaningful impact in your community in terms of context. So I think all those are really important. And, you know, one thing I learned is that, you know, if you get into this field and you have a passion for helping, you know, the community that you want to serve, uh, it's important to have a thick skin. So rejection is a common thing, but it shouldn't really discourage you from going forward. So, all right. So we have time for questions, please. This is your great opportunity to learn from Moses and ask questions. Hi, um, Moses. Thank you again. I, I have a follow-up question. So, um, well, I noticed from your presentation that you did anatomy and then you did um, obstetrics and so your research so, sort of makes sense. Now, um, I, I don't have that science background and I know I have an interest in minimal invasive surgery, which is more like, um, or your reproductive medicine. But then it seems my research so far is focused on maternal morbidity and um, mortality. Um, do, does one try to marry the two and end up doing a maternal fetal medicine specialism, for instance, so that I can continue that research in that area? Or can I pursue my other passion um, it, it, it's, it's still um, quite confusing, but um, I do admit yeah. that I am into both. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, thanks, thanks, Chipo. I think that's, uh, yeah, of course, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's sometimes you get to a point of where you feel a bit confused of which direction to take. Uh, I, I think my mantra is always, to follow your passion, what, what excites your heart, because then what excites your heart, you'll have the energy to push it through. What you don't like, you don't wanna do. And if you do, you get stressed. So uh, the, the issue is 
uh, you know, this fellowship, the Glocal Fellowship should provide you with that opportunity of trying to find out uh, what is it that you really want to do? Uh, how do you want to do it? And so, uh, yes, you should be able to, to pursue. And there's always a meeting point in science. It's never really done in you know, horizontal or the vertical silos. There's always a mixture of horizontal and uh, you know, vertical. So they always reflect at some point. So uh, if you want to do a lot of research in reproductive medicine, for example, and you want to have it impactful in the global health research, then uh, there's always a room for that. If there's, there's also room for maternal fetal medicine and uh, how you can also apply your research. So there's always a piecing thread to it. Uh, and it's something that you can, over time, if you're a patient, you just need a bit of patience and talk to your mentors also, see what they say, listen to them. And oh, definitely they might have some good wisdom for you. I don't know if Lee, you have something to add there. Yeah, I, I think Moses, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I think it's, it's important to follow your passion. Um, and also, you know, one thing I would say is like, you need, you need to be patient. So by that, I mean that, you know, um, you know where you want to, you know, you would know where you want to end up, but getting there is a process. So my, my advice is you have to play to your strength, right? So you know, if you if you are confident in a content area, I would encourage you to pursue that. But, you know, if you have passion in another area that you need more training in, uh, like Moses said, you need to kind of work with your mentor to kind of develop, you know, your additional expertise. But trust the fact that it doesn't happen overnight, but with with support, with team science, with mentors, uh, you know, if you see opportunities, for example, for GlowCal Fellowship, like Moses mentioned, this is a really, you know, important opportunity for you to develop more skills uh, in in areas that you might you believe that you need more training in. But um, but the important thing, I think, as Moses said, is you got to find area that you know you find joy in. And and you know the the challenge is to figure out how to how to maximize and strengthen that area, and um, you know understand that it's a process and it doesn't happen overnight. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? So I think we still have some time, right, Richard? Um, I would like to take the opportunity to maybe um, get some practical advices on when you were starting, you know, doing your PhD, but starting also to get in more uh, students to work with you. And I think that that period of time might be a little overwhelming because you have your own research and then you are um, trying to guide students from different levels. So I wanted to know if you had an uh, aha moment when you said, okay, this is too much. I have to organize. How, how did you do it? And um, if you have any advice for the ones that will go through that path. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yes, uh, thanks Lopez. I think I've, uh, I've had many aha moments. Uh, many times I said, oh, I think this is too much. I, I, I just want to take a break uh, and reflect. So when I did my PhD and, and my OBSGAN residency, I didn't have many students to supervise. The only students I had were the undergraduate students who do it a calculated program. After that, when I was doing my fellowship, that's when I got uh, master's students and PhD students. So it was quite, quite tough. Uh, to try and balance. And that's why I mentioned the issue of uh, time management. Like say, this is time dedicated to looking at the student's work. I need to read and give feedback and then maybe stay with them and also talk to them. Uh, so I had those time blocks that I was able to develop and that, that, that worked for me. Uh, of course, later on, uh, uh, I, I got more students and it has always happened that 
you know, if you want to do good supervision or good mentorship, then you also need to provide time for your mentees and your mentees have to be available. So I noticed that also takes a bit of my time. Uh, but then I say, I'm, I'm, I'm doing basically something that I like. So I really don't mind it. Uh, the drawback to that is that now even the students, because we're in a teaching institution, those who you do not directly uh, mentor want to come to you for mentorship. So you ask yourself for how, how far can you stretch? So practically speaking, it's, imp it's difficult, uh, but then you can give, you know, once in a while, one or two hours to, you know, to mentor those who are not in a mainstream mentorship group. And that's something that I also do uh, serially by basically segmenting the time of uh, exactly what I'm doing. Uh, it's gotten to a point where I think uh, if you have a number of people you've mentored that have grown, then they can also now form a chain of mentoring others. And so you don't have to continuously be the one doing everything. So you have a chain of uh, the older brother or the older sister mentoring the younger sister and the chain keeps on growing so that you have less work at the end. And uh, that's what I'm also learning to do that I've to mentor at different levels. And I encourage peer mentorship and then also uh, having uh, the older one mentoring the younger one before the younger one goes directly to, gets directly to me or to someone who is higher than me. So that's how I'm working with it, uh, Florella. Yeah, thanks. I don't know, Lee, your experience, what's been? I, yeah, I think, I think that's a good point. And uh, it's a really important question. And, you know, as I reflect on what we experienced this year, as well as last year with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, you know, one of the silver linings is that this virtual engagement sometimes um, makes it a little more um, efficient in terms of inter interacting with mentor mentees. So instead of having a one-on-one -on -one physical mentoring, you can have multiple mentees join, almost like this platform where you can exchange ideas in a much more efficient way. What I would suggest is as a mentor, as you're embarking on this mentoring role, um, you know, have an, have a strategy where it's basically accumulation of your mentoring session. So for example, if you're providing mentoring virtually, I would encourage you to say, record that and then have it as a resource so other mentees can view the consultation that you provided. So you don't have to repeat the sharing of knowledge um, repeatedly, but have, uh, you know, compile like a central resource source, resource um, and it can be viewed like asynchronously. So once you provide that expertise, it's always gonna be there as a resource. So I think they're innovative and other ways to just strengthen your mentoring, uh, you know, styles and strategies. Great, great question. Okay, any other questions, reflections, observations? So I appreciate you, Moses. And I think um, in terms of time management, I think you've done an excellent job. And, oh, um, and, and I think it's, it's great that we get to, you know, end this session on time. So, uh, it, you know, it's, it underscores how, how skillful you are in terms of managing your time. And, you know, oftentimes it's always harder to, you know, stay on time. So yeah, sure. you know, yeah. thank you for your attention. And also all the GlowCal fellows, thank you for your attention and engagement during this session. And I really enjoyed it. Thank you, thank you so much. All right. Thanks okay. everyone. And uh, I guess we'll see each other again, like next month, Richard. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, bye. All right.